food and history go together like peanut butter and jelly, sugar and cinnamon, the English crown and incest. And today we're going to pay homage to the importance of history and food by taking a look at the drinks from the brand new Tasting History Cookbook by Max Miller on today's episode of Mike's Hard Reviews. Hey there, hi there, ho there. My name is Michael. I'm a bartender from Kalamazoo, Michigan. And today, yes, we're taking a look at the Tasting History Cookbook by Max Miller. If you've been around since the, uh, the you know, the time that this show was kind of revived from the weird old days, um, you saw the 25 Drinks of Christmas series. And one of those uh, episodes was about Victoria Punch, something that Max had discussed on his show over on his YouTube channel uh, that I decided I wanted to make myself. Since then, Max uh, has been so successful in what he's done, which makes me endlessly happy, uh, that he's been able to produce a cookbook, uh, the Tasting History Cookbook, uh, released in, uh, I think, mid-April, I think it was, like April 14th, around that time. I pre-ordered a copy of the book, uh, and unfortunately kind of forgot that I had pre-ordered it until Amazon said they shipped it and I had to fit it into my schedule. <laughs> As a result, uh, I'm doing this a little bit off the cuff, but also um, I'm excited because there's some really cool stuff in this book. Most of it is um, is food recipes, admittedly, and I mean, I'm, I cook quite a bit. I'm the cook in the house. So this, this is a phenomenal, fascinating, and weird dive into unique cuisines from all over the world uh, and all over history, for that matter. Um, and Hidden amongst the pages of all the food in here are a couple of cocktails and uh, some drinks that we can make. So today we are actually going to do three different drink recipes from this book, which is why this video is so fucking long. And we're going to just give them a taste and talk about them as a way of celebrating the release of the book. Congratulations, Max. This book is awesome. Not just the content inside, but also the quality of this hardcover is fucking insane. And I dread the day that I start cooking the recipes out of it and destroy it by spilling ingredients on it. Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into our first recipe of French lemonade. So yes, you heard me right. We are starting off by making a lemonade, something that is distinctly non-alcoholic, which is a first for the show. Uh, but we're we're gonna fix that because the French invented brandy as well. This is a French recipe for lemonade that comes from 1651, originally from a cookbook called the Cuisine Francois. Lemonade was incredibly popular in France as sort of this bright, refreshing recreational drink and as a sort of tonic for a variety of maladies, which may have held some validity, not necessarily because it was good at treating those things, but because the leftover scraps from lemon peels contain oils that kill fleas and ticks, which at the time were the things that spread most of the disease people were facing, like the bubonic plague. That popularity like, legitimately can't be understated. This was the most popular beverage for at least a short time in France, if not much of, you know, uh, I guess colonial era France, I guess is what you have to phrase it. That popularity does eventually carry over to the US, especially around the time of the 1880s. Approximately like 1887, it becomes a very big thing, especially with people who are invested in temperance, the banning of alcohol. And uh, not gonna happen, not in this house anyway. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and make this absolutely delicious uh, French lemonade. And I can, I can tell it's gonna be delicious because it has oranges in it. <laughs> now that might be a weird thing to say. You might be thinking, why are you putting oranges in a lemonade? because it's the trick to a good lemonade. Oranges uh, maintain acidity, but also add sweetness uh, and don't require additional dilution uh, or artificial sweetness from sugars to be added, which is why they're perfect for making lemonade with, especially if you need a little bit of sweetener. So this recipe is going to require 1000 ml of water. I've got that set aside here in a large mixing vessel. You're gonna need at least two vessels to make this with, one to build the lemonade in and then another to strain it into. For our actual fruit content, we're going to need two oranges and six lemons. Uh, we'll also need uh, some sugar and a spoon to stir everything together. Granulated white sugar is fine, by the way. You're probably seeing the sugar in the raw and thinking, oh, do I have to get that specifically? No, you don't. You can do whatever kind of sugar you have on hand. I just want to use this up. Um, I do like sugar in the raw. It carries a more natural kind of molasses-y brown sugar flavor to it because it isn't processed. Um, but granulated white sugar is fine and probably more accurate for this time period. Um, because pounded sugar was a thing, so. Anyway, to start this off, I'm actually going to take our water here and we need to zest half an orange and half a lemon. Citrus fruits have a lot of naturally occurring oils in their peels. It's where a lot of their flavor is sort of maintained whenever we're not talking about the juices. There are a couple different methods in cocktail mixology uh, that involve using the peels to make things like syrups. Oleosaccharum is a relatively time 
uh, time appropriate for this this drink specifically uh, creation. And that's a good example. You take the peels of lemons and rest them in sugar until they naturally take out all those oils. In this particular case, we are going to include them in the process of making our lemonade to allow those oils to diffuse into it and provide a more bold, rich flavor. So I'm gonna take my zester here and I'm just going to drag this along section here. Alrighty, so once we have the zest of half of an orange and half of a lemon set aside, I'm going to just gently clean off my grater. I'm going to put that into the water to allow it to diffuse and pull out those oils. Like I said, we are going to strain this out, which will catch pulp from both the fruits and uh, the zest that we're putting in there to flavor it. So no need to worry about you know, having, you know, having to drink any of that. It will be pulled out. It's just gonna add some additional flavor before we do that. Next up, I'm gonna go ahead and add my one cup of sugar. And like I said, you don't have to use sugar in the raw. Um, I'm just choosing to because I have it on hand and uh, I wanna get rid of it. <laughs> in fact, I don't have enough for a full cup, so I'm gonna split base it. Like I said, it doesn't really matter. Um, any kind of sugar that you can dissolve into water will be fine. I have my heaping cup here. I'm just gonna gently pour this in and make a mess of my floor, fuck. I'm gonna let that sit in there for some time to hydrate while we go ahead and squeeze all of our citrus juice. While we're letting our sugar sort of hydrate and begin to dissolve of its own accord, I'm gonna go ahead and start juicing our fruits. there is all of our citrus juice squeezed. With that part of the process complete, I'm gonna go ahead and pull my, my sugar and peel base back over here. I'm gonna give this a stir until that sugar begins to dissolve, or rather has dissolved completely, ideally. Okay, after a couple minutes of stirring, we've got that fully dissolved. Uh, now what we have to do is add in the juice we squeezed. We're gonna give that another cursory mix to combine, just to make sure everything is getting to know itself in there. And now, we have a nearly finished lemonade that we just have to strain. I wanna say, look at this color. That looks so much like orange juice from just those two oranges, but you smell it and it's just lemon in your face. It is impressive. Let's go ahead and get our second uh, vessel and we will strain this so that we will have our finished product. Oh, we're gonna strain this off into our secondary vessel, or ideally it'd be your serving vessel. Uh, and we need to do some straining. The ever so fun, always time consuming straining of products. <laughs> so I've got a coffee filter here and I'm also going to do something that I've discovered kind of recently. I'm going to place a straw down in the pipe here and put this filter over top. What that does is give passive airflow underneath the uh, filter, which tends to have, you know, has a tendency to cling to the side of the colander. It allows air to flow out and then uh, liquid to flow in. It kind of stabilizes the whole relationship, so straining doesn't take as long. I'm also gonna put everything through my cocktail strainer here as well, just to give it as much a leg up as I can. <laughs> so we're gonna put all this together and strain off the pulp and zest. If you have something like a cheesecloth, that would work well here too, because um, you don't need something super fine to catch all of the particulate. Um, it's okay that there's some in there. We're not trying to like clarify this by any means. Um, unless you were making a milk punch and then, you know, you'd want something a little bit more fine. But um, if you have something like a cheesecloth, you can use that. Um, a nut milk bag, that'd work well too. Um, but if you're making do with what you got like I am, this is just fine. So we're gonna let this sit here and do its thing. Uh, it is going to take some time, so I'm going to set it aside and we are going to move on to 
Well, you know what? Actually, we're just going to let it do its thing. We're just going to let it chill out there and, and, and wait and do what it's got to do. A few moments later. You know what? Actually, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not patient enough for that. <laughs> we're just trying to catch the, you know, the zest and the, the larger bits of pulp that come from the juices. We don't need to, to be super careful about this. We're not making a cold brew concentrate here that would require us to remove all that particulate. Uh, and frankly, I'm thirsty, so <laughs> I'm just gonna put this through my cocktail strainer and call that call that a day, frankly. Put the strainer over, grab our jug, pour it on in. Let that finish straining off, and there we have our French lemonade. Uh -huh. Now, normally you'd wanna let this, you know, chill covered in the fridge for some time to, you know, chill off and be a little bit more refreshing, but I just spent 30 minutes making it, so uh, I'd like to reap my benefits now. <laughs> Got a glass of some ice here. Let's go ahead and give ourselves a pour of this refreshing, refreshing juice. It really does smell like all of those fresh juice essences, the oils, especially from the little bit of zest we threw in there. Uh, I'm wondering if me using a grater may created a, a more fine zest than you would get otherwise. Um, and or maybe not as fine, and maybe that pulled more oils out. I don't know, but it's really potent. Uh, so let's take a sip. Salut. That is perfect. That is, that is beyond perfect. <laughs> that's, that's amazing lemonade. <laughs> wow. It's bright and tart, but not like super tart. It's got just enough sugar in there to cut back and dilution from the water too, actually. Because when you think about it, most of this is actually water. I think this works out to be about a third, uh, a third part um, juice and two thirds parts water. But that combo is like perfect because you're still getting a lot of really potent citrus flavor that is lightly sweet and still bright and still acidic and still refreshing. And it tastes awesome. <laughs> I mentioned briefly that this was popular with temperists. And I can see, you know, yeah, yeah, I think it's what they're called, temperists. I can see why. It's It's got all of the refinement of making, you know, cocktails or punches, like punches, punch bowl drinks specifically, but it has no alcohol in it. Uh, and if that's something that, you know, you're trying to avoid, that that's perfect. You know, that, that it's, it's great. This especially, this exact recipe is like perfect. I, however, am not a fan nor a member of the temperance movement. So I'm going to put another one of France's great inventions into it, some brandy. I'm just gonna free pour about two ounces. That looks about right to me, I don't know about you. <laughs> now it looks right, there we go, okay. That's Christian Brothers brandy, by the way. I prefer Hennessy, but I actually didn't see any at the store when I went and I didn't want to go to more than one store. So I, I just, I just elected to go for uh, the, the, you know, the basic stuff. Don't do what I'm doing right now, by the way. This is wicked dangerous. This sharp is, sharp, the knife is wicked sharp. Don't do that. Anyway, now it's a proper cheers. <laughs> okay, you know, maybe the temperist movement people got it wrong because that's a great drink on its own. It makes, a wonderful, and I mean truthfully, wonderful mixer. That's amazing. If you put this in front of me, <laughs> like a brunch event, or like at like a like a picnic or something, or help had it on a menu, and we're like, "Yep, French lemonade. It's got brandy in it." Uh, I would order it two or three times. <laughs> That's amazing, and I want to finish it, but I can't because I have. Two other drinks to make. Next up, we're gonna go from France to America and look at an actual cocktail, uh, one of the very few that appears in the book itself, no less by the first master mixologist, Jerry Thomas. So we are moving on about 200 years in the future from our last recipe uh, and from France to America, where we look at a Jerry Thomas recipe for what is called very simply a gin cocktail. This comes from the 1860s and appears in uh, Jerry Thomas's 
book, uh, How to Mix Drinks or the Bon Vivants uh, Handbook. And essentially it's one of the first cocktail recipe books to ever exist. Jerry Thomas is kind of the person who figured out all of this stuff and wrote it down, put it all in one place at the very least, um, which means that it became the basis for a lot of classic cocktail technique and styling. And this cocktail is one without a name, yet still one that exemplifies everything that a good classic style cocktail should be. The book talks about, uh, the cookbook specifically talks about um, this thing happening in England called the gin craze, and that kind of deserves its own video if I'm going to talk about that specifically. That, or you can click the link up here to go watch Max's video on it, because why not? This is a celebration of his work, not mine. I'm just sharing his work with you. So go watch his video. So this is actually um, a very specifically measured recipe, uh, and there's not a lot that goes into it, but the, there is one specialty ingredient you might have a hard time finding, and it's called Boker's Bitters, B-O-K-E-R apostrophe S. Boker's Bitters, otherwise known as Bogert's Bitters, which I think is their, their two varieties of the same kind of cocktail bitters, uh, is an aromatic bitters that was popular and widely available at the time Jerry Thomas was bartending. For a very long time though, after that, it kind of got lost. The recipe wasn't getting made, there wasn't any of it in circulation until sometime in our current cocktail renaissance, uh, I think sometime in like 2000, 2000 like the 2000 aughts, something, um, when a company called The Bitter Truth started to reproduce it under its original recipe. Now, you can find that in stores. Specialty liquor stores should carry it, at least, you know, some of them will. Uh, mine did not, but the folks over at my local uh, wine and spirit shop, um, specialty shop, that is, Tiffany's Wine and Spirits, did some research for me and found out that the best, nearest alternative is a product called Scrappy's Bitters, and this is just their traditional line of aromatic bitters. Apparently this is the closest in flavor to what Bogart's Bitters is. And I've never had it before, nor have I, nor have I ever made this, this cocktail. So let's go ahead and see what this tastes like by giving the cocktail a shot. Now, uh, this is a stirred cocktail and the cookbook does actually make mention that Jerry Thomas isn't very specific about the rule of shaking or stirring this cocktail. So we can do just about whatever we want in that regard. Proper technique because there's nothing to aerosolize says we should stir it, which is what I'm going to do today. I'm going to start the process by adding two ounces of gin, a London Dry specifically. Next up, we're going to crack open our brand new bottle of bitters, throw in two dashes of our Boker's Bitters or Boker's Bitters alternative. Interesting. I don't, I don't, I don't detect it. I don't detect it yet. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Next up, we need a bar spoon of simple syrup, uh, five mLs more specifically. And technically speaking, it should be a gum syrup. A gum syrup is a simple syrup that has had gum acacia added to it, which is a thickening agent that creates a kind of silky smooth mouthfeel. Um, that detail isn't necessary. Um, so I'm going to do just some regular simple syrup today. Then finally, we need, weirdly enough, um, half a bar spoon of Grand Marnier, uh, well rather not Grand Marnier, but dry curacao. Dry Curacao is a brandy-based orange liqueur. Generally speaking, they are sweeter than triple sex, like Cointreau. This one is Grand Marnier. Technically speaking, it is not a dry Curacao. It is a Curacao-like product because it is brandy mixed with triple sec, but we're splitting hairs at that point. We need half a bar spoon of it. How do you measure half a bar spoon? I don't know. That was basically a full bar spoon. So let's just roll with it. <laughs> as far as the cocktail itself goes, that is actually it. That's all we need. So I'm gonna grab some ice and then we will stir this to chill and dilute. For stirred cocktails, I like to crack two whole cubes and uh, put them both in the glass so that there's enough surface area to prevent too much dilution while still getting the right amount of chilling. With our ice added in, I'm gonna go ahead and stir this for anywhere from 12, 15 to 20 seconds to chill. And the loot, what we're looking for is the outside of the glass to lightly frost and it to be very cold to the touch. With that properly chilled, I'm going to grab a cocktail coupe, which is the proper glassware for a drink like this. And we're going to take a Hawthorne strainer and strain out all of the small ice chips. Now I have mentioned before that my cocktail coupes are particularly small, or rather particularly large. So small cocktails like this don't, balance out great, but that's the correct proportions. So we're gonna roll with it. And now we'll move on to our garnish. 
Technically speaking, the proper garnish for a cocktail of this nature is a lemon peel. So I have a wedge here that I had cut earlier today. I'm just gonna go ahead and peel off, or the cut off this peel, express that over the drink. <laughs> Snapping it in half in the process, I didn't know that was possible. Put a little cut there into it and rest it on the side. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Gin Cocktail by Jerry Thomas, the first master mixologist. With our station cleaned up, let's go ahead and take a sip of the second drink by Jerry Thomas. Oh. Oh, that's delight. That's, ooh, okay. That's fascinating. <laughs> first of all, it's very alcoholic. <laughs> Being mostly just two, two ounces of gin with a couple of added flavoring things in there, uh, it's pretty, pretty darn high proof. Um, that being said though, it's really embracing the gin botanicals as a result. And there is most certainly a really nice interplay between the bitters, the uh, dry curacao specifically, and the gin. The symbol in the background is probably sweetening it up and bringing it all together. But as it stands, this is a really well-balanced cocktail, despite how little of anything is in it. The bitters is interesting because I've never had Scrappy's bitters before. And to be... Fuck the camera. Problem solved. It's a little difficult to pick out specifically what kind of flavors the bitters is bringing, but to describe it, it's kind of like the essence of what Angostura is absent of its really Im like impactful and strong baking spice notes. I would say this is more along the lines of like rich dark herbs and roots, um, more than it is spices or like, uh, green herbs. It's not like a cilantro herbal. It's like a, a sort of um, like maybe taro herbal. Not having a real, I say that without having a real frame of reference of what taro tastes like, but that's, that's the sort of impression it gives me. You know, it's nice. The flavors are surprisingly well balanced. And honestly, maybe it's a little bit kind. I mean, honestly, I think it's kind of a little bit sweet. You know, the full bar spoon is simple in there and the liqueur, I mean, the bitters is pulling it back, but I get like a lot of it. And maybe that gumakasha fixes some of this really sharp potentness that the alcohol has. Without it, it's still really good. I just, you know, it's very old school and even so old school, in fact, that it's not quite to my palate anymore. Despite the fact that I do drink like somebody from the 1800s most days. <laughs> well, with that accomplished and given a, a solid taste, I think it's time that we move on to our last drink of the day because we've got one more recipe to go over and uh, I do not want to overdo it. I've already had enough alcohol. For this last one, we are going to be staying in America, but technically making something from England, despite the fact that American Christmas is the place it calls its home. So finally, our last drink of the day, if you could not tell from the hint of Christmas calls at home, is uh, eggnog. This particular recipe comes from the Americas, uh, specifically 1887, if I'm not mistaken. And it's a little silly to say it's from the Americas because it's not. Uh, eggnog is actually an American appropriation of a pre-existing English drink called passet, or passe, depending on who you're asking. The drink is a combination of ale and eggs made into a sort of punch and that is exactly what eggnog is, but instead of using ale or wine, as Passet does, eggnog uses liquor. In this case, both brandy and rye whiskey. <laughs> the reason why it becomes an American phenomenon, I think, is largely because it gets associated with American Christmas, which is a big deal around this time period, given the Puritan societal standards of America at this time. Frankly, that's enough for me, because I fucking love eggnog, especially homemade eggnog. So we are going to make one today uh, but we're gonna do things a little bit differently than they appear in Max's book. Max's book um, gives you a recipe for a punch bowl style eggnog, one that you whip the whites and cream the yolks and, and everything is sort of prepared and tempered and done very artfully. Um, it also makes 12 servings, which I am not going through a whole carton of eggs to do. <laughs> I also don't have that much of a liking for for eggnog, I like it, but not that much. <laughs> I've pulled back the uh, the recipe so that we can do just, you know, a basic, very easy, very simple um, one serving thing. Uh, not just because I don't need that much eggnog, but also because eggnog was available year round at most bars at the time. 
Uh, eggnog, while it is kind of associated with Christmas, was just another cocktail in the book that is a bartender's recipes. And if you walked into a bar and asked nicely for one, they could make you one assuming they had what they needed. It wasn't always a sort of holiday time thing. So uh, as a result, we're going to make a single serving version using the same ingredients and a relatively uh, similar spec to what the book would be just pared down. That starts with one ounce of whole milk, which I am somehow going to pour out of this giant gallon. I definitely should have put this into a smaller container. Well, that didn't go as bad as I thought it was going to, never mind. We're also going to need a half an ounce of heavy cream. If you're like me and you're lactose intolerant, maybe don't make eggnog at home. We're good. <laughs> I always like to check, the, the carton throws me off. I never, I never trust the carton. Next up, we need an ounce and a half of brandy. It's important to note, that seems like a lot of alcohol, and that's only one of our two spirits in this case. You have to remember, people back in the day drank way more than they do now. It was a social expectation to do so, and people were not, you know, off-put by the notion that you were drinking most of the day and were probably drunk most of the time. As a result, we are going to add a full two and a half ounces of liquor here. And that gets finished off with one and a half ounces of rye whiskey. You want rye specifically for a recipe like this, one that's historical, because rye whiskey today is as, you know, the closest approximation we have to what they had back in the day. And additionally, it's also just really good for character. <laughs> one last thing I nearly forgot, we're also going to need an ounce of simple syrup. And finally, the thing that makes it eggnog, one whole egg. Now you may be worried like, oh, hey, hold on. You can't just eat a whole raw egg. Actually, yes, you can. <laughs> the fear surrounding eggs and their food safety as a raw food item is inflated and a little bit unnecessary. If you store your eggs correctly, they're not cracked when you go to use them and they're within their best by date the chances of you catching salmonella, while increased because you are eating raw egg, is no more dangerous than eating like raw fish in a sushi place. It's fine, you'll be fine. <laughs> We're gonna go ahead and give this first a dry shake to break up that egg and froth our milk and cream to sort of give this a nice luxurious mouthfeel. A dry shake like this is dangerous because it's gonna wanna make the uh, shaker expand, so get a really good grip on it. Shake it for about 30 seconds. I like to depressurize by taking the cap of my shaker off first, putting it back on to catch any loose liquid, and then taking the main cap of the shaker off afterwards. I shook with a cocktail spring that helps emulsify everything and bring it all together at one time. It means you can use the same amount of force for a shorter period of time. It's a good technique, you should do that. I'm very winded. <laughs> To finish this off, we just need to add some ice, our usual one cube cracked, one cube whole, and then shake to chill and dilute. Put our cap back on, and I'm gonna wipe that down real quick so I can get a good grip on it again. We're gonna do our usual 12 to 15 second shake. A cocktail like this will get served normally in a punch glass if you're making it in a bowl. I like, for single servings, uh, Irish coffee mug, because I think it looks really nice. I'm gonna go ahead and grab my cocktail strainer here, crack this bad boy open, and then double strain it just to catch any loose ice chips, because they will float to the top and separate, and you don't want that. Now the garnish for an eggnog like this is going to be a fresh, ideally fresh grating of nutmeg. I have no fresh nutmeg, unfortunately. It's not very easy to find around me. So I've got some powder that I'm just going to scatter over the top. Boom. And that, ladies and gentlemen, serves forth as a homemade 1887's eggnog. With our station <laughs> kind of sort of mostly cleaned up, we can go ahead and give our classic eggnog a taste. Got a lovely kind of vanilla, oaky, whiskey, brandy smell on the nose with this really loud nutmeg on it. I'm very excited. Cheers. I should say, I'm excited for the way it tastes now. Not the way it'll make me feel in three hours, but um, holy shit, that's delicious. <laughs> it's, it's, it's creamy and silky and thick, but not like 
gloop, disgusting, gross thickness like you'd get from a store-bought eggnog or you'd find around Christmas time. This is well, well, well crafted, well put together. It's not super thick on your palate and it doesn't taste artificial. It's got just this really nice light vanilla and oak and all the character of the combination of brandy and rum thrown in there, not to mention a nice hit of egg nut, uh, nutmeg on the top. Oh my God, so good. Really, it tastes kind of like a whiskey milkshake. Honestly, you were to take the flavors of whiskey and put them into a milkshake, that is what that tastes like. It's lightly vanilla and has, has these really nice, you know, rye flavor characteristics to it. Maybe a brandy is better here, honestly, for modern palates because it's got that kind of vanilla honey thing going on in its flavor. Something like Elijah Craig actually, sub out the, uh, the rye, and maybe hell, sub out both the rye and the brandy and just do two and a half ounces of bourbon. That'd be really, really good. I think, and I think more people would like that than like this. But that being said, dude, it's good. <laughs> Admittedly, my taste buds are a little blown out from having done uh, a, now a triathlon of drinks in this epic that, in the epic that is this episode of Mike's Hard Reviews. But that still shines through as lightly sweet and creamy and delicious. I have definitely officially hit the point where my brain is like, you don't have energy at all anymore. And I have a sink full of dishes off screen in that direction that I have to take care of before I'm done here. So <laughs> wish me luck in that regard, I guess. Well, that is all for this episode of Mike's Heart Diffuse, ladies and gentlemen. I am officially brain dead, um, not even from alcohol, but from exhaustion. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching, and again, congratulations to you, Max Miller, for the accomplishment of releasing your book, which has, I, as I have now learned, after watching his most recent video as of the filming of this show, that it is now a New York Times bestseller. That's fucking amazing, and congratulations. That's awesome. Also, thank you for doing what you do and making history a digestible and delicious thing to watch. Um, it, it, what you do is a lot more <laughs> important that I think you realize, sort of giving people a reason to like learning, um, even if it is, you know, short, you know, short term and on various niche subjects, it's still learning. And that's something that I respect the absolute shit out of. And I'm really glad to hear that this book release went as well as it did, and even happier that I got to pre-order one. So, so, sob story over. Uh, that's all I have for you guys today. Um, if you want, go ahead and follow um, uh, Max. His link will be in the description down below, like right at the top. Um, you can go there to find his channel if you don't already watch it and subscribe and watch a bunch of really cool videos on uh, historical dishes and the history behind them. He also had a minor series going for a while called Drinking History, which was more in the line of what I do now. Um, I, haven't, I can't recall the last time an episode, an episode of it came out, but um, it's a good show. So watch that one too. <laughs> If you want to follow me, go ahead and click that like button and subscribe down below. Um, I make a video every single Friday and then sometimes on Tuesdays, which I'm going to try to get back into. I, I'm taking a break right now because it's a lot, but I'm trying. If you follow me on my socials. Uh, I have an Instagram, a Tumblr, and Reddit, which are showing up on the screen right now. I haven't been on Reddit in a little bit, but I'm trying to work my way into Instagramming more often. Like whenever I make a drink, I make a post basically, um, including what is going to end up being uh, a three you know, a three picture post from this episode's production. Go ahead and follow me on those socials if you want to catch more of this stuff. Uh, I'm trying to be more active on there and you guys following me tells me that you want me to be active. So thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed, like, subscribe, do all that good stuff. And I will see you in the next episode of Mike's Hard Reviews. Remember to drink responsibly and have a great rest of your day. Cheers. I'll see you around. Bye-bye.
I have so much footage to edit down. Oh my god. <laughs> this is gonna take me all fucking night. I should have filmed this episode last week when I had the time to do them back to back. I filmed the episode on the hair while the I should have filmed this episode too. I didn't need to procrastinate like that. Holy fucking shit. And now I gotta clean up all my stuff because now everything in my fucking house is dirty, sticky, or otherwise- Oh shit, the camera's still going, holy fuck.